Good Thursday afternoon, fortified fourth graders in Mobile County. What a gorgeous afternoon it is, but I'm not going to rub it in too much because I know you're probably inside watching this great lesson. Well, I hope it'll be great for you anyway. Boys and girls, thank you for joining me again. It has been a great few weeks with you, and I can't wait for a couple more weeks. Just think summer is around the corner. So as we continue learning about reading of informational standard, fourth grade first, and by the way, today is our last lesson on this standard, but don't cry because we have two more weeks of learning a really great standard, but I'll get to that toward the end of the lesson. So looking at our standard this week and over the last couple weeks, again, boys and girls, we're going to refer back to the text. As we know, this standard has the word text in it three different times. And when you have a word three different times, we know that it's extremely important. So text, the text is very important when you are inferring or drawing a conclusion. So that standard says, refer to details and examples in a text when explaining what the text says explicitly, now that's when the author just comes out and says things. And you're going to see an example of that in today's text. And when drawing inferences or drawing conclusions, you could even put that synonym in there from the text. So boys and girls, just take a look at this standard. We know how important the text really is. And boys and girls, we've looked at a PowerPoint that I've created over the last few weeks. We've looked at, we have looked at how important the text is, whether it's the text features or the text structure. And I really wanted you to visualize that this is a two-part puzzle piece. You're taking your information from the text as well as your background knowledge and you're putting it together to make an inference or draw a conclusion. So that's really what we're continuing working on today. So we're going to go ahead and look more into that today. And just for a few moments, I want to just remind you really quickly, and I think my goal last week was met, or excuse me, on Monday was met. I just want to remind you again today, an inference or a conclusion is an educated guess where you're going beyond what the author is telling you it can also be referred to as reading between the lines. Your inference or conclusion will most likely be different than someone else in your classroom or even in your home, for like what we're dealing with currently with the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember the text structure, the text features such as uh, headings, titles, subheadings, as well as photographs, captions, Timelines, any of those text features are very important to help you draw a conclusion or make an inference. There's that two-part puzzle piece, boys and girls. The text evidence, along with your background knowledge, will help you draw that conclusion or make an inference. Don't forget to put it to the test. Am I using the, the actual text? Can I circle or can I underline? And boys and girls, don't forget to use the captions, use the actual photographs. You might can actually circle something within the photograph. That could be text evidence, even though it's not literal words or letters. And then don't forget to ask yourself, does my answer make sense? Did I really answer the question? So I just wanted to remind you of that as well. So now we're going to go into the actual text for this or today's lesson. And just as I promised, the text title is Fruit of the Bog. Now, I left you on Monday with a little food for thought. And I said, what fruit could this be? Hopefully you've had a few minutes to talk to someone or do your own research to find out that the type of fruit this is, is cranberries. If you like cranberries, 
you're going to find out more information about them today. But before we read the text, don't forget to read the directions. As I said on Monday, read the social studies passage. Use the study buddy. Do you see how cute that little study buddy is? I just want to squeeze him and kiss him all over. I really do. Some people make fun of me for doing that, but that's okay. I'm into little animals. I bet you are too. <laughs> but it says, use the study buddy and the close reading to guide your reading. Anytime that we look at something closely, we, we look a little bit and examine it a little bit more closely or read it to, for a little bit more information or a little bit more detail oriented. So boys and girls, remember that this close reading is to guide our reading so that we can find those details and so that we can infer even better using those details. So let's take a look at this text now. Fruit of the bog. Now, I've been flounder fishing in the water with my mom and my dad when I was a little girl. And do you know what? I got scared. You're probably wondering why I got scared and why I'm even telling you this story. Well, it's because I got bogged. I couldn't even move. I was screaming for help. I was, Mama, Daddy, help me. I'm bogged. I didn't think I was ever going to get out of that water. Well, that mud. My goodness, I was bogged all the way up to my shins. Oh, I was so scared, and I was just a little girl at the time, probably around your age, actually. Well, if this is fruit in a bog, hmm, I wonder why this fruit's in a bog. Hopefully, you're asking your own questions. Active readers, good readers, answer and ask questions as they read. That is a really good reading strategy, as well as reread strategy. I was just talking to a fifth grader yesterday about the importance of the reread strategy. So hopefully, boys and girls, you're not forgetting any of these other reading strategy that your kindergarten through fourth grade, yes, fourth grade teachers have taught you. Don't forget, boys and girls, the importance of all your reading strategy and all of your reading skills because you're going to need all of those skills and strategies to help you become a better reader. So let's take a look at the first paragraph. It says, the first people known to eat cranberries were the Native Americans in northern regions of what is now the United States. Hmm. Do you see that word native? Wow, we just talked about that word native just the other day. And we talked about native being the first people. Oh my goodness. Even in the text, there's context clues. The, the second and the third word says first people. Oh yeah. So we know that they were original to that country or to that land, or they were born there. So if you're native to a country or native to a land, that means that you were born in that country. So Native Americans, they were born in this country. Many of us immigrated or migrated from a different country or our ancestors did. Let me rephrase that or fix that. So the Native Americans were born here. They didn't migrate. And it even says what is now the United States. So way back when, we're talking about this era. It wasn't considered the United States. Now we consider it the United States, but at this time it wasn't considered the United States. And it says, century before the pilgrims arrived in 1620, Native Americans ate a bread made with cranberries mashed into cornmeal. Hmm. Look at that word, centuries. I see that word part, cent, and I remember that my teacher taught me that 100 pennies 
equals a dollar. And cent, like in per cent or per, per 100, there are 100 out, something out of 100. So cent means 100. So it says centuries. Oh, that's 100 years? So 100, many hundreds of years before the 1620s. Wow, talk about ancient. That's even older than my grandfather. That's even older than my great-great-grandfather. Wow. So centuries before the pilgrims arrived in 1620, Native Americans ate a bread made with cranberries mashed into cornmeal. Hmm. So undoubtedly, they used the cranberries to flavor this type of bread. Wow. Hmm. Kind of like a cornbread, a cranberry cornbread. Hmm. Maybe like a muffin of some sort. Hmm. Very interesting. And it also says here that it says they, they ate a bread. And we know that bread needs to be baked. Now, let's check out that really cute study buddy because I think he or she may have something of a clue to tell us. It says, I make inferences all the time. And boys and girls, you do too. You just don't think about it. For example, the text says, Native Americans ate a bread made with cranberries mashed into cornmeal. I know that bread is made by baking. So I can infer that Native Americans baked food. And boys and girls, you may be baking things at home with your family during these times as well. You may be actually making your own bread too. Wow. Now, I can infer too that they didn't make the type of bread that we have today because they didn't have ovens like we have. They didn't have stoves like we have. So we could even talk about what kind of ovens and or what kind of apparatuses they used. Of course, they used fire and things like that to make their bread and to bake in. So that is pretty neat, isn't it? Wow, we're learning a lot about how even the Native Americans cooked back then. So let's go ahead and read the next sentence. They also munched on dried cranberries throughout the winter. Hmm. This takes us to what we've learned about Native Americans and think about what you've learned in Alabama history this year. We know that Native Americans hunted and they gathered. Certain people's job in the village was to hunt and other people's job was to gather. And in different seasons, different people had different jobs. So, and more of the food was more plentiful during different seasons. During the colder months, there wasn't as much food to gather. So we see that it said during the, throughout the winter, we know that they munched, that's a really good word right there. That's a great action verb. That helps paint a great picture in my brain. They munched on dried cranberries. Now we know that during the winter months, frost will fall on the ground and it will kill a lot of the vegetables and the fruits. So, oh, Miss Cook, you were forgetting it said dried. So they were very smart in that they dried their cranberries. Oh, much like we eat trail mix today with dried fruits in it, like cranberries and raisins, which are dried grapes. So in order to keep their diet plentiful of fruits in the winter months, they made sure that they dried their cranberries. And that also gave them fiber so that they could still be able to have enough fiber in their system so that they could use the bathroom even during the winter months, which was good for their stomach and for all that they needed to do in their digestive system. So we also find out in the next sentence that Native Americans made, oh, excuse me, I skipped one. 
but cranberries were useful for more than just food. Oh, I see a very interesting word, useful. I see the root word use, but I love that suffix full. It tells me that it is full of something. So cranberries were full of other things other than food. So what in the world could have Native Americans used cranberries for other than food? Well, let's see. It says, Native Americans made dye from the berries to color blankets and rugs. Wow! So we find out that cranberries had that beautiful red, that ruby red, that deep red color that was also made to color blankets and rugs. And if you read into your Alabama history book, and maybe you even went to old Alabama town during your Montgomery field trip this year, you may have also seen where clothing was even dyed. They also used, I um, know I'm getting a little bit off the cranberries, but they used flowers and things like that that had beautiful deep colors and like blackberries with their pretty colors too. If you've ever picked blackberries and then looked at your hands or looked around your mouth, you will also notice that they have a beautiful pigmented dye of that deep purplish red color too. So we find out that cranberries were also used to color blankets and rugs, so fabrics. And the last sentence of the first paragraph tells us, and they used the berries as a medicine for the treatment of wounds. So if someone got hurt, so if they were out gathering and they got splinters or they got um, harmed by woods or something like that, they would even use it for the treatment of wounds. So we find out that in fact, cranberries were useful. So that is the first paragraph. So let's take a look now at the second paragraph. In 1810, Henry Hall from Cape Cod, Massachusetts became the first person known to cultivate cranberries. Now that word cultivate, if I don't know what that word means, I can try to find context clues. I can use a dictionary. I can use many resources to figure out what that word means or I can read on. The word cultivate means to grow as a farm crop. Now, boys and girls, when we talked earlier in our standard, I told you that we would actually see an explicit part of where a author would actually tell us what a word means or what it, in this case, the author is actually telling us what the word cultivate means because he does not want us to not know and understand what this passage is trying to say because we don't understand the word. So that was very smart, in my opinion, of the author because without vocabulary knowledge, then it can break down our understanding of a topic or in this case, comprehension of what it's trying to say. So it says the word cultivate means to grow as a farm crop. So we find that Henry Hall from Massachusetts was the first person to cultivate or to farm the cranberry. Cranberries grow only in particular conditions. Wow, so we find out that cranberries are unlike many other fruits. They grow best in bogs. Oh, now we're going to find out more about bogs. They need an acid peat soil, a steady water supply, and a covering of sand. The growing season must last from April to November, followed by a dormant period in the winter. And dormant means an active or a sleep period. In other words, they just rest. They do nothing. The winter chill is needed for the fruit buds to mature. In this case, mature means to grow, to get bigger, okay? So look at our close reading companion right here, or our close reading portion, it says, Cranberries need specific conditions to grow. Underline two sentences telling what conditions they need. And I see that the first one is they, re, um, reporting just on cranberries, they grow best in bogs and they need an acid peat soil, a steady water supply, and a covering of sand. So that's the two sentences that you would underline there. Now moving on to the third paragraph. 
For years, the number one cranberry producing state in the United States was Massachusetts. However, since 1995, the state of Wisconsin has been the top cranberry producer. In 2010, Wisconsin harvested more than 4 million barrels of cranberries. Wow! Do you know how cranberry farmers know when the berries are ripe and ready to harvest? The small berries float to the surface of the bog and bob along there. Well, that is pretty interesting, boys and girls. The farmers are able to pull off this nifty harvest trick because inside each berry is a tiny pocket of air. Now, the next close reading question says, did Native Americans cultivate cranberries? And it says, draw a box around a sentence that helps you infer an answer to that question. What do you think that answer is? If you said no, you are correct. We know that right here in paragraph two, this very first sentence, it said that Henry Hall from Cape Cod actually cultivated cranberries. So you would box in this very first sentence for that one. Excellent job, boys and girls. Now we're going to go ahead and answer two multiple choice questions. Number one, read this sentence from paragraph two of the text. The winter chill is needed for the fruit buds to mature. What would most likely happen if one winter were too warm? So here's a hint. What would happen to the buds if they did not get their winter chill or their dormant period? A, people would give up growing cranberries in the area. B, cranberries could no longer grow in the soil. C, the chill would take place in the spring. Or D, most of the fruit buds would not grow properly. Well, we know that that dormant period is when they mature and grow. So the answer to number one is D. Most of the fruit buds would not grow properly because that's what they do during the winter. If I had time, boys and girls, I would have went back to paragraph two. Since my time is running out, we're going on to number two. Based on the text, which is most likely true about Wisconsin? Now look at our study buddy, it says, or our hint. Some of these choices might be true, but you need to find the only choice supported by details in the text. And boys and girls, what I did is I used my process of elimination to mark out the ones that I knew weren't true for this one. A, it was first settled by Native Americans. We know the Native Americans were in the very first few paragraphs, so we know A is not true. B, it is a major producer of blankets and rugs. The text said that the blankets and rugs were actually dyed by the cranberries by the Native Americans, so that's not true. C, it provides the conditions needed for growing cranberries. That could be it. Let's check out D first, though. It has always been the number one cranberry producing state. We found out that actually Massachusetts was once the most producing cranberry state. So we find out that number two is actually C. Boys and girls, your exit slip today is to continue paying attention to details while you're reading your AR books and you're doing your I ready practice each day and or week. I do have a challenge for you. Please do your own research to find out more about the cranberry so that the next time you eat dried cranberries and trail mix or the jellied kind the next time you sit down to eat Thanksgiving with your family and or friends, you might surprise your friends, your neighbors, or even your family members with that new knowledge. Next week, we are going to learn more about how to use the text to answer questions either about literature or informational text. Boys and girls, you have one more week in order to submit all of your work, whether it's online or through your packet. Just think, boys and girls, we're almost done. Get you a snack, take a little break as you get ready for Miss Weekly's math lesson. Thanks, boys and girls, for your time this afternoon. I look forward to seeing you again on Monday.
拜拜。